And I was thinking, you know, yesterday, what am I going to do with the wads? And um, I have to say, today is a day where I really don't have to earn my money because it's so easy to introduce him. So without further ado, give a big round of applause to the man, Steve Wozniak, that we call the Woz. I mean, okay, I'm usually not one to, you know, gossip about what we've talked about backstage, but I have to let people know. Um, you don't have Netflix at home. Netflix is in my home city, Los Angeles, California. But, but for all of us mortals, when we want to watch a movie, we just stream it in at home, most of us. Right, and, and I have Netflix that I can download a movie, but I can't watch it. And, and, and why, why is that? that? Why is that? I don't that? have my enough broadband to where I live, I live in Silicon Valley, one kilometer up a little hill from the center of, you know, dense, dense housing, but I've got a lousy phone company that doesn't run a good wire, and I'm hardly home, so I haven't had time to see if I can establish microwave links, and I, I did that in the past, where I microwave links to friends' houses. I don't want to deal with other people that I'm counting on. So, so basically, I don't watch television, and I and I just download movies from iTunes, and, and once they're there, I can watch them three days later. So Steve Wozniak does not have broadband internet. And I, but I travel most of my life, so more than half the days, I'm away from home in hotels, so I have some kind of broadband, some kind of internet, and sometimes it's fast. All right, let's, so not not, let, let, let's tell the truth about internet in hotels. It's usually, usually bad. Usually, yeah, usually internet in hotels, just like my home. That's what my home is, now you know. Oh, yeah, you feel like you're in a hotel. All right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, sounds, it sounds really strange, you know, because back in the early days of the internet, and I paid my money for a megabit and a half, a T1 line, and everybody else had little dial-up modems, and I was king of the hill. Yeah. And now I'm kind of at the bottom of the pack. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, we were talking earlier this week about you coming, and there were two words that kept coming up. Nifty and nerdy. Huh. Well, my whole nifty means that engineering-wise, very clever, coming up with things that never existed before, saving parts, being efficient. Yeah. But, um, but, uh, but those are older days, and I love being known as an engineer. And I, I, I was told that at CBIT, if you, if you want to be nifty and nerdy, um, you have to have a smartphone, and on the, that smartphone, you have to have two apps, three month and Tinder. You know what those are? No, I don't even have one. No, I'm sorry, I'm missing out. But, but you, you know you, what? Apple, Apple though has a different thing. Apple says, "Hey, smartphone isn't what it does. It isn't functionality like what engineers and nerds want. Right. If the nerds want, it's oh, it's jewelry in three colors this year. Three colors, like you're gonna sucker people into buying something to coordinate with their clothing, you know, with their wardrobe. I'm uh, not me, but then again, I do have to have one AT and T phone." Um, because I have a grandfathered plan, I need Verizon in the United States, and I need the unlocked T-Mobile so I can travel the world, so I have all three colors. Uh, okay, I was going to ask you, okay, you have all three colors, right? Well, what, what, what technology do you use? I mean, most of us run around with smartphones. What and technology? Um, I use, oh, mostly I use my iPhones as mobile technology, and I use my MacBook Pro computer when I'm in hotels, more efficient type eight, larger screen space. A lot of things I try to look up on, on little small phone tablets and scrolling things back and or maybe you're trying to plan a route, a trip on a map, but the computer screen's a lot better for me. So I so I kind of live in both worlds, and the computer's probably the more important overall. And and I love I love also buying all the different the, the important phones that get introduced, smartphones these days, are one of the important categories of products. But it might also be, you know, some laser beam projectors, loop type of things. I love buying small little products that do the new things and keeping up with seeing what other people are experiencing. I love to play with other platforms and, and then you know I go, oh wow, I love seeing that. that's clever. How did they think of that? That is so cool. And I don't ever sit there and say, darn, I wish I had it on my iPhone, even if I did. When you think about Apple today, do you say, wow, that's still cool? Um, 
You know, yes. In the past, Apple has been a leader in setting the new tone and the new direction for the world. And all of our smartphones, no matter what we have, we really have to credit Apple for today's style of smartphone, for one thing. And in the past, there are companies like Apple. Apple was the first one to help develop a FireWire, the first one to put the USB ports in their computers. Um, it's just been a company that has this reputation, a belief in it. Everyone's looking to Apple for the next future. Not just an improved product, but a new category of product. And it doesn't happen very often, but Apple's been a star. So yeah, it, it has been a star, but it's not shining very brightly right now, is it? Well, we're in one of these periods where, you know, you get to periods of new products that kind of so good. Apple does something so good, it doesn't have to be changed very much for a long time. Look at even our, our laptops, the MacBook Pros, you know, and the uh, the Airs. They come out and year after year after year, it's kind of like a uh, Mercedes vehicle. They look very similar. You got to hit the good formula because you've worked so hard and put so much good engineering and thought and design into the product. You don't have to change it that huge. Software changes a lot more now. Let me, before we, before we talk um, about tech, let me, let me talk a little business with you. You're a shareholder at Apple. Um, I don't know if you have read this, but the analyst trip Chowdhury has called for the resignation of Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple. He, um, he has said that Cook has been at the helm and has watched Apple shares decline by 25% since September 2012. He says Cook should be fired. What do you think about that? I don't agree. Cook hasn't been at the helm of Apple for a long enough time to totally judge him. We haven't been able to see what new categories of products are are being developed secretly. Uh, Steve Jobs could went for a while after he came back from Apple before the stock ever raised in price with the iPod. We opened it up and we wrote iTunes for Windows. Who knows what's going on in the company? Um, secondly, losing 25% of what, what, what did you say, Liz? 25 percent in September. Shareholders, shareholders care about that one. care about that when the stock price goes down that much. But um, we had some stiff competition, let's say, in the smartphone arena. You know, unfortunately, a lot of other companies came out with great products and sort of did some catching up. And so that's, the, you know, I don't, so I don't, I don't take that to mean so much. Who's, who's number one? As far as sales, as far as profits, as far as company valuation, who's number one in the world? And in your point, the company said, oh, they're doing something really wrong. Once you're at number one, it's very hard to hold everybody else. You know, there's 10 other companies that are trying to push you out. I mean, I'll grant you that. So, but I mean, but I, I can't judge it. I don't see the mistakes. Okay. Tim Cook is a very, very hard worker. He's very good at execution. And sometimes people can have a lot of artistic vision where we should go. <laughs> Somebody has to spend you know, almost 20 hours a day thinking and working on the details to execute properly, and I, I believe Tim Cook is very good at that. I don't really know him that close and personally, and I'm willing to wait, but I'm willing to wait longer time. Was Steve Jobs' death fatal for the magic at Apple? Um, I would never say that. That's all just sort of a looking back thing. If he had lived, would Apple be better or worse than it is now? Nobody can say for certain. You don't like to look back and say, what if we had made some different decision? The company would be really great. I'm sorry, you got, what you got to do is say, how can we be constructive and think of a path that will get the best outcome for the world, for Apple, for the products in the future? Keep the direction that Apple is going for you. That's, look at that, I mean, Steve Jobs' death, people were saying that before he died. People were saying that years before he died. If he dies, then Apple will be, what will Apple be? Um, but that's a lot, there's a lot of myth that's built up into one person. And the company and the culture and the sort of people that think a certain way there. Um, Tim Cook was more influenced by Steve Jobs than anyone in his life. And, you know, and he's got other Steve Jobs around him and, and paying, you know, knows how to pay attention to when they're, they're coming up with ideas and thinking visions. But do you, like think, Steve. do you think if Steve Jobs were still alive, though, would we be talking about something new? Uh, would we, I mean, we're still talking about the iPhone. Do you think that there would be a, a, something new that we would be talking about now? I don't know. I'm kind of, I, I really, my favorite cars in the world are Mercedes. <laughs> pretty much the same. Well, you're in the right they've been, they've been the same 
all all my life very much, and I like that. You like that stability. Um, there are a lot more people in the world that are not technically oriented like this audience, but are just afraid to acknowledge to the world they don't have know how to use a smartphone. And the safest place in the world for them is a safe place that doesn't change, that is protected, that you can count on it. You've got a lot of friends you can ask questions, and you, you get a lot of help right at the stores. You've got a lot of, hey, you can purchase one on one training even if you're embarrassed to acknowledge you don't know things. This is the best place for the masses of the world. Do it is the iPhone. And you know what? To some of my friends, I'll recommend even Android phones. I'll say, oh my gosh, what you like to do and all the things you're into, and, and you should get, here's a, here's a great phone I highly recommend. You should get the Note 3 or something. Uh, but, you know, but for the right person, the masses, oh my gosh, just stick with an iPhone. It's the safest bet you can make. Do we expect too much from Apple? Uh, do we expect too much from Apple? Uh, we expect a lot from Apple. But you know, Apple has a lot built in just because of the passion of followers. So I don't know if it's a question of expecting too much. Yes, I think there's an awful lot of people in the technology community, the bloggers, the, the passion of the people that are looking for hot new products like the iPhone and the iPad to come out again very quickly. I want to wait ten, six months, what does Apple have? And I think that's, yeah, there, there's too much expectation that Apple can do something in a half a year that normally happens once a decade. There is a lot of talk right now of, about the tension that is growing the, between Silicon Valley companies and Washington. Trust issues, spying issues, um, is, should Silicon Valley companies, should Apple companies, should they be angry and upset with the U.S. government? <laughs> you know what? I'm, a, I'm an iPhone user. I'm a user. I believe in the small guy. The individual consumer is the important one that needs protection. We don't know who we can trust when it's a company with, a, with millions of lines of code in their product or a government. We have, you have no idea. In the early days, you bought a product and it was guaranteed, it was supposed to do one thing in your life and did that one thing and it didn't do a bunch more. Maybe it was a shovel, it just worked. Maybe it was even a printer and it just worked and did its job. And nowadays, you have no idea what's going on. No, I, I really am glad to see Ted Burgers Lee asking for some kind of bill of rights. It should be like maybe every single owner of every smart product should be able to have a log listing every bit of data that was sent in or out of their product while they used it. You, you say maybe. You say we can't we can't really trust any any company. Can we trust Apple? I can't say that for sure. I have no idea. Could there be secret back doors inside of the products? I don't know. I'm not that close enough to no one person could know there's millions of lines of code and it would be um, you know too too hard I don't think it's possible for a human being to tell you for sure. Once in a while, you have your spot some little loophole that might have been deliberate. Yeah. This could have been going on for an awful long time. But you know what, that, you know what happened last month? Um, Apple released the iOS 7.0.6 and said that it was a security update. Um, and according to documents that Edward Snowden released, um, the NSA gained the ability to intercept encrypted iPhone traffic back in October 2012. That's why we had the security update recently. Did someone at Apple add a back door for the NSA? I have no idea. My first suspicion is no. My first expectation is no, they didn't. However, could there be um, maybe somebody, it was like an extra line of code that they identified that got in there? Maybe it was done deliberately, maybe it was done accidentally. I'm not going to try to guess. Coding um, mistake? Yeah, it could, yeah, it was, could be a small coding mistake. The funny thing is, small little mistakes can create bugs that have huge impact and affect your life. And um, and I'm hoping that Apple is the purest of all the companies. You still think it's the one that would fight, you fight, you know, government having the ability to intercept things like your messaging. However, I also think back to a time in my life, maybe it was 15 years ago, a long time ago, maybe even longer, and I sat down with PGP, the encryption software for your email that was done by a third party, Phil Zimmerman's company, and it was trustable. I trust them. And if I had PGP and my friend Alex had PGP, when I sent him a message encrypted with his little, his little, his public key, he got it. I know that nobody in between could possibly intercept it. And I remember with PGP though, it was really fun to go on and say, hey, let's look up and see on the big public key server if Bill Clinton has a key. Yeah. And there was a Bill Clinton, and he 
lived in Finland instead. Ah. So what I did was I created a whole bunch of these uh, women that he was supposed to be associated with. Paula Poundstone and Jennifer Flowers and all these names. Uh, and they were all, 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 all authenticating his, his, his key as being the right one. Uh -huh. But then I found out that when you searched for Bill Clinton, you didn't find those others. You only got him and it didn't show. It showed some blank names identified were authenticating him. So then I went back and I changed it to Jennifer Flowers, Bill Clinton, Jennifer Bill Clinton's friend Flowers. Yeah. And then it, when you search for Clinton, you get all of these women too that were vouching that he was the real one. The real one. But that was, that was for fun. You okay. got you to include fun in everything you do. But if Apple, and I mean what in my mind was if Apple and Microsoft had decided we're building right into our operating system, our key email programs, PGP is a part of our, is a part of our device and every single email in the world to this day would, would be encrypted. You know what? I used to send messages in an envelope that you'd lick it shut, and the fact that somebody got it and it was still sealed meant nobody had seen it. Yeah, there, there are ways that it could have been steamed open, but only, only under the right authentication, the right validation. And now every single message we send is an email. It's on wires on the internet, and we have no idea how secure it is, if it's secure. Yeah, but this, this is where you see, when you're talking about sending information the old way, snail mail, for example. You know, there was a report out recently that EADS and Airbus, they're so worried now about corporate espionage and about their software being attacked and tapped that when they have high security plans, they send it via paper, via courier. Don't you think that don't you think that's a sad commentary on the tech world that you help that you help give birth to? Yeah, but there are, there are possible solutions. And I'm just throwing one. If every basically if we just put PTP into the major computer platforms that became very common and known, it's you know a public key, private key encryption system. There are others for temporary conversations like phone calls and videos that the keys are made up on the fly every transaction. We could have a lot more secure world, but even the com the computer companies seem to not want to go that way and just just build it in from the ground up. And if they build it in, they're going to build it in under auspices that we don't know if they don't put in their own little back doors. Who is going to to take the lead though? To I don't know protect us. I mean who do you want to see take the lead? Not Apple obviously. Yeah, but okay, but you might think but you don't you, you I mean you don't see that coming though, do you? I don't see it coming. You just gotta put one little button in your email program and and the code to do it, I don't know. I don't see a couple more. Don't you get, I haven't seen it for 15 years. Yeah, don't you get on the phone, Steve? Don't you get on the phone and call the CEO and say, come on, guys, get your act together, and let's be trailblazers. I used to do that when Jobs was there, yeah. and he would fix things pretty quick. <laughs> but the trouble is, once he fixed up the for me, and took out a feature that I desperately needed. So I said, um, no, I don't, I don't do that. I, I don't even call up and say, hey, can I have one of the new products? You know, rather stand in line and buy it like a normal person. What about the cloud? What about the cloud yeah. everyone's talking about? That, that's that whole problem. Do you own what you have? Is there the secret code inside of your phone that does special things? That means you don't really own it. I mean, you should buy something and totally have control of it. It is what, it's, what you think it is and nothing more. Wait a minute. The cloud. What was that? The cloud. The cloud. That's the, that's the Scottish cloud. Yes. Yeah. How the cloud operates. How the cloud operates, where your data is being stored under what what when you say okay, I agree, yes, yeah, I want this, you know, you click all those buttons so fast because you don't have the time to read all the legalese. You've signed away all your rights because it's a contract. Yeah. And they wrote them, you didn't have a part of writing the contract. So the other side always has it. Anything happens, goes wrong, you know, it's not our liability, it's not our problem, and, and it's our ownership. Even if your photos are here, we don't guarantee you'll get them back. No, I I, um, I think that human beings, the, the normal end users, the average guy in the home, is, um, has really lost out to the, the powerful and, and the wealthy. Well, you know, you're, you're in Europe yesterday. Um, Oh, you got a pause there. Um, the, the European Parliament yesterday uh, approved sweeping new data protection legislation that could become law in all 28 EU countries. Um, it includes the right to be forgotten. Um, it increases fines on companies that give private data to outside EU companies. Yeah, this is great. This is all great stuff. The EU is going to be ahead of the United States in most cases for that sort of thing. And do you think the United States needs to start copying Europe for a change? Well, I wish they would. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think they should get ahead of Europe even. Um, I, 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 I would love to see with Tim Berners-Lee's proposal, I'd love to see some work get going on that for every country in the world. Thinking about what can a Bill of Rights be, that what can be done to you know, product legally, you know? I mean, and people say, that's government regulation. Well, our Bill of Rights in the United States is, is, is regulation, but it's regulation of other people aren't allowed to regulate. Our Bill of Rights says, laws will not be passed that will abridge your freedom of speech and things like that. And, and it's really, that's really, I mean, if every single message, I can't send a message to my wife saying my favorite color is blue. And I want it to be private. And I just feel like this is open to the world now. Everything is shared. I guess we got used to that with the social web too. Um, did you imagine that back in the 1970s when you were creating personal computer? Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, I mean, did, did, you imagine, did we imagine we'd ever have um, a, a, a cellular phones, or did we imagine that we would have um, a, a, enough memory in a computer to hold a song? No. So, so no, we didn't think way, way out. The science fiction writers, of course, thought about computers once they become kind of conscious, but they're not there yet. Computers aren't really conscious. With all the networks being tapped and all that, but yet you're, yet you're, you know, you had your sport in 1984. Yeah. Great, great new world, you know, we read books when we were young and um, gave us a lot of values, but those values didn't seem to matter. They can't stop technology, the changes in technology, they come like a huge, huge steamroller and you can't stop it, get out of the way. The best thing to do is get out of the way and let it happen. Um, that's change and we can't, you know, it's, it's taking us where we are. And every time you get change, you're afraid, oh my gosh, look what we've lost from what we had before. But the new generation says, hey, this is just the great world we're growing in. This is the way it should be. You know, a, a lot of political leaders here in Europe, they look to you um, also for, for policy guidance. You know, you're an engineer, you're not a politician, but they look to your expertise. Um, well, they should, because what politician has ever moved the world forward? For sure. He said it backwards. Everyone will argue whether it was forward or backwards. Every single technology company leader. You know, the, the, the CEOs of the technology companies, like Tim Cook, they're the ones that are more important because they only take the world forward, forward, forward. And well, why, why aren't you running for office? I'm not political. I have this philosophy against voting. It goes back to Vietnam War days and stories I don't want to tell. Okay. But but you don't have faith in, in politicians to, to protect our rights as technology. Oh, some, some, some are trying, but generally, no. They're all pretty much bought off for the most part. Um, what do they do? They just ban selling Tesla automobiles. I have a Tesla, and I bought it online. And I picked it up at the factory. And now in New Jersey, you're not allowed to, they're not allowed to sell Tesla cars because it doesn't go through a third-party dealership that makes extra money on the way. You know, what are they doing? Look at the consumer. The consumer, not the seller. Not the manufacturer, not the businessman. Look at the consumer and make things um, better for all of us. I mean, let me, so why is it, you know? Let me challenge you a little bit. I mean, it's hey, political. It's so all political. They got paid off. You have so much influence in the world. How can you afford to be able to? I mean, you could run for office and get elected, and you could really affect change. You could be, you could be the smart no. Donald Trump You could, you could put computers into schools and make them better, theoretically. And yet people aren't coming out smarter because we put them into the same system that always existed, that has its flaws and its weaknesses. Could you change that if you were a politician? In the school system? No, no, no. One politician, you're stuck in the political system that's so screwed up, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be, you know, there have been one or two politicians here and there throughout time that try to make real good moves and they, they kind of can get nowhere, they're loners. They're all on their own. All right, let's not talk about politicians. Let's talk about people, infamous people. Edward Snow. Is he a hero or is he a traitor? Well, he's a hero to me. He might be a traitor to other people, and I understand their reasons for thinking that way. But I have very strong beliefs in freedom. And when I was young, it was Cold War, United States, Russia, the communism. They watched all the people very closely. They reported them. People could be disappeared in the secret prisons. Um, and we had freedom in the United States, and it was based on our Constitution and our Bill of Rights. And I believed in that. And one after another after another, I see those Bill of Rights crumbling and everything. And where's the freedom going? And here's a guy that must have felt like me. I believe Edward Snowden believed he wanted that country to still have the freedoms and caring about the people and the, the rich, powerful government, military, all that isn't as important as the normal people. And they were doing illegal things that went against our constitution that gave us freedom. 
he, I believe he believed it in his heart the way I would, and he had the guts and the courage to give up his life, to sacrifice his life for a principle. and had been that courageous to make that sort of a move. Um, I'm one of the founders of the EFF, by the way, here to say a little bit. Do you think um, Edward Snowden should be allowed to return to Absolutely. He, and he's been vindicated. There have been legal judgments over and over, and, and the, um, the, the NSA, and by the way, we have other three-letter agencies in the United States, the, the CIA and the FBI and others, and they're probably all doing similar things, you know. They're probably saying, "Good thing the NSA is taking the heat." <laughs> but you know, I feel like Loopholes. They'll cover up those loopholes, and but they've already been shown to be in really a violation of our constitution. What happens is a lot of the, the politicians that have kind of gotten there, you know, maybe because they're highly paid, maybe from the religious right. A lot of politicians pass law after law after law that are go against the constitution, and then in court, when people like Snowden come up, they say, "Oh no, no, what the government was doing is according to this law number five, law number eight, law number 10. But those ten, it's ten years later, the Supreme Court finally rules those laws are unconstitutional. The, the Constitution pervades. It's a long, long process to get the justice. You know, um, I live here in Germany. I've interviewed a lot of German politicians. One in particular, by the name of Christian Strobler, he's with the Green Party. He visited Edward Snowden in Moscow. He wants Edward Snowden to be granted asylum here in Germany. Do you think Germany should give Snowden a home? I would probably vote for it, but I don't know enough about the total German situation um, to give a firm answer. But I would be for it, I'm sure. I tried to go to Moscow myself to see Snowden. I was trying to work like Have you talked to him? I may have very, very unusual. This is so unusual, I can't even believe it. Um, but if you I was in have... Moscow. I was yeah. in Moscow. Yeah. And I was at an Apple Museum some private invitation thing. There's about 30 people there, and I'm taking pictures with them and meeting them all, maybe 20. Maybe as few as 20 people. And a guy came up and he looked just like Snowden. I'm surprised. He's so young. After I took a picture, I said, you could be mistaken for Snowden or something. He turned away. I never saw him again. I saw him before or after that picture. I kept looking for it. And it could have been. And I was saying possibly in the Russian press too about what he done. You know, I'm, have, you been, have you been to Colorado lately? <laughs> yes, I have. Why? I thought so. Okay. Um, has he tried to contact you? Um, no, although people that claim that they were in touch with him have, and said they're trying to set up some meeting and he maybe like me to be in a roundtable discussion. So it's possible. But and you would meet with him. That could be the same. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Turkey's Prime Minister, Erdogan wants to ban Facebook and Twitter. He said, and I'm quoting it here, social media is the biggest menace to society. Well, that's true, but you can't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I was recently in Beijing, and I was shocked that Facebook didn't work there. I didn't know this stuff. I thought the internet was just wherever the internet went, you kind of had everything. Do you watch the so news? I can't use a VPN. What? Do you watch the news? I, I don't watch television. I read and I don't know to what extent they have filtering of the internet in China. Now I found out a lot of important things were missing. But you get around that with a VPN anyway. Right. But um, I was shocked because when the internet first started, I got into it so early. I even got a three-letter dot com. Was.com. I don't use it because I'm more like a nonprofit, was.org. But, um, and I got in so early, and it's like this was a breath of fresh air. The internet, anybody anywhere in the world can publish things if they know how to make a server. And other people can see what they publish. An academic can publish articles that you have to have a brain, you know, you'd have to buy a third party profit making book to have the information before. This was a breath of fresh air. We are controlled. We aren't controlled by the forces of control, which are governments. And now it's like the internet gives them the ability to control us more tightly than ever before in our life. 
every bit of communication is is now controlled by every government and monitored and everything else. And I, I and it's it's bad. When when Erdogan made uh, announced that he wanted to ban Facebook and, and Twitter, um, we announced that on uh, on my new show, and I got tweets like crazy from people in Turkey saying, "Please report that this is how you can bypass these blocks." Are do you think? It, that people will always be able to bypass these blocks, or will the technology progress to the point that governments will be able to build a secure wall? Yes and no. A lot of times people will be able to um, bypass them, but if it ever becomes like enough people are bypassing it, the governments will make the wall more secure. And it might be a little battle throughout time. Um, in the old days, we had ham radio. We had a disaster in the world. Ham radio operators could get on and contact and send messages far away. And there's still nothing that can really restrict a ham radio operator. There are no laws in place. They're not. Um, they're not as, as trapped as the internet world is. Um, so, so it, it's, it's just a shame that we can't have cure anybody in the world. I can be in direct communication with, them, and that's gone. That, that thinking of that kind of freedom, we're a whole new country that doesn't have a country. It's like we're outer space. Nobody owns outer space. The moon, nobody owns the moon. The internet, nobody owns the internet. Now everybody, the internet is just totally owned in the sense that we're controlled by it. Um, Kenneth Roth, the head of Human Rights Watch, he told me recently that access to the internet should be considered a basic human right in the 21st century. Do you yeah. agree? Like yeah, probably everybody in this room, I agree. Absolutely, and basic human right is <clears throat> education, we have a few of them. Um, obviously you consider things like the right to drive a car and things like this, pretty much as right. So they talk about it as a right or a privilege. Well, there was a declaration, I forget what year it was, 19... Gosh, 39, a long time ago, every major country in the world signed the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. And I got it passed down to me. I went to a, um, a, a, an Amnesty International concert once, and Bruce Reaching was playing. They gave me a little booklet, and I carried it in my backpack to this day of that declaration. It's so important to me. And they didn't have the internet the whole days, but that's our main factor of communication. I think broadband is, it should be a human right, and everybody in the country should have it. Countries like Australia are trying to work to bring it to every person. If you know the, who gets elected doesn't change. I mean, are you worried though that the, that the internet is going to become fragmented and you know it's, it's 25 years the World Wide Web 25 years old this week? Are you worried that when we're talking about the World Wide Web being 50 years old, that we're going to be talking about national webs and no longer the World Wide Web? <laughs> um. I don't know, I've never thought about that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even want to think about it. No, I think it's always got to be worldwide. We've got too many friends in every part of the world now that we've formed. We can't, you can't have schools contacting other schools and have their students communicate directly and immediately with schools in Africa. You can't turn that stuff back. If, when you look back on your career, is there anything that you regret that you would have done differently in terms of the technology that you've given us? No, because my philosophy, my personality from the time I was 20 years old was not to look back and think about, I wish I'd done something different, I'm not going to, to look at it like having regrets, no. I wouldn't even look at divorces that way. <laughs> really? 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 No. Okay. You know what, if somebody's bad to you, you're good to them. If you love somebody, you'll love them forever, you'll never let it go away. I, I got a lot of really good um, philosophies, you're always uh, forgiving and you're not judgmental. Um, I, I mean, I have to ask you too, um, since you're talking about divorces, relationships, um, you were on Dancing with the Stars, you uh, went out with Kathy Griffin for a while, right? Yeah. 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 Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant comedic mind. And I like comedy, because comedy is the heart of creativity, being able to make up new jokes. She just makes up a statement, one after another after another, and they're all jokes. So you, you loved her for her mind? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I love that. And, and I've been on television, I've been on the Big Bang Theory. And, you know, it's really great because I got to see how television is made. I am so lucky. I consider myself so lucky in my life, and so does my wife. What was, what was harder, founding a computer company or going on Dancing with the Stars? <laughs> well, you know, that's like asking somebody who grew up their whole life to be an archer. What was harder, um, you know, being able to arch, get to the Olympics for archery 
or um, running a marathon. I mean, they were, they, their legs weren't conditioned for running the marathon. So in that sense, dancing starts is harder. Everything I did with computer days, I was so excelled at designing. Anything I could think of in my head, I could design products that put the signals out, and it became very easy for me in a very short time to design almost anything. I mean, when I was in high school, I could design any computer in the world in two days. So when it's that easy, it's like you give me free time at night, I'm going to sit down and design computers. So when I'm doing it for a company, Apple, it's just like I'm doing what I would do without a company. Do you still do that now? I mean, at home, do you sit down and say, I want to, I want to create something? No, I don't. I really want it. Yeah, I say it all the time. I want it every single minute of every day, and I can't do it anymore. And it unfortunately, goes back to part of those personal philosophies you live your life by. And one of them is to never close myself off like, like executives of companies do, I won't answer. So, so I'm wide open, and the amount that the internet has given me thousands of emails a day, and I don't have time in my life. And I get invited to be in great places like this. So I don't have time left to be the, the sort of designer and engineer I was back then. Yes, I do think about products, how they could be improved, how they should um, um, have something new that might make them work better. I'm even with a company, Future.io and I do some of that thinking, but it's not the same type as when I was the direct engineer actually creating things. You know, a lot of people want to start companies these days, they have ideas, but ideas on paper aren't worth much to me because of how I started. You get a working model, even if it's a virtual model on a TV screen, that you can interact with and really show people. You'll learn a lot more and you'll make a lot more from it. What is, what's your mission now? I mean, I, I've, I've seen interviews with you where you said, you know, um, creating the personal computer was the culmination of your life. I've seen that quote up. So what, what that was, you know, that was a long time ago. Well, I never used the word culmination. Okay, well, then, word then, word then, word. then that was a bad reporter. Yeah, oh, oh yes, in reporters. Yeah, what's your uh, reporters, yeah. Uh, over and over, you know what, I say things and they twist it to the headline sounds the opposite because they're trying to make themselves the modern columnists, bloggers do. They want to get noticed, but you get noticed with a striking comment that Wozniak said this, and it's usually just sit down to her thinking if you really read what was inside of it. So, yeah, so I'm used to that. So, so what, what's your mission now? I mean, you get up in the mornings now, I mean, you travel a lot. I mean, what do you want okay. to do now? I think about my technology evolution when I was in high school and university. Those days were so important, buying every computer manual, studying it, I cared about it so much. I would work out halfway through the, the book, answering every question the, the, before class even started. I loved it so much. So I want to inspire young people, especially, um, and be kind of a, maybe a role model, inspire them, convince them that you know, if you're a geek, if you're an outsider socially, you still have great things you can do in the world. So I'd love to, that's probably number one if I had a mission. But I don't really have a mission. My mission is to enjoy life and have fun. The day I, the day I die, I'm gonna judge myself by how many times did I laugh and smile versus how many times did I frown. So I have ways to, to magically work both of those. Have you made it? I love my life right now very, very much. You know, even going around places like this, just being on stage, just, yeah, I love it. And you know, the day I, the day I quit, that'll be a happy day too. Have you made it cool to be a computer nerd? Oh, gosh. Um, I think that that happened not because of a person. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of even an unusual computer nerd because of Apple's success. I've been able to kind of get one level beyond it. Like if you look at the founders of a company like um, like Google, they kind of, you kind of become more social in the world and more of a normal person. But I care so much about the geek that I was back when I didn't have any hope of a girlfriend or anything like that. I had to spend all my hours designing and stuff. But now women love guys who... Well, I don't know that I agree that. I do not think young women really still love geeks ever. Um, sometimes they admire a little bit of a certain geek that... Um, there's certain elements of them, but I don't think it's uh, that much stronger. But you know what? You know what? You know what really gets their I, attention? I don't think they're. I don't think they're really the popular heroes of the girls. Do you know what really gets their attention now, though? Is when you do selfies that get retweeted thousands of times. So you know oh, what? Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna pull out. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna get one right here. <laughs> What's going on here, gentlemen? We're going to have a Comic Con in San Jose, California. We need you. <laughs> um, I think that. I think. 
But we're gonna do a, a selfie here. Um, I don't know, he's got some kryptonite in his pocket. Let's do a big two here, ready? One, two, three. There we go. Now, I'm gonna tweet that, and we're gonna see if we can beat Ellen on the Oscar night. Come on, you wanna do it? Let's try to do it. Okay, Okay. Let's no, that, that selfie was incredible. Let's, let's see what we can do. Hold on, I mean, come on. You, you gotta have a dream, right? All right, hold on. Let me do that. Let me think, you can think of a better example, though. Um, here we go, let's see. Put this in. It's kind of neat, I would've just want to speak into my phone. Tweet. Tweet. Here I am with pause, period. All right, here we go. I just want to talk. I don't want to go through procedures and thinking. All that left brain stuff, that was the old thing. So there we go, bud. Let's <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. Let's we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. There we go. Um, we, we've got time. I know we've got a lot of tweets coming in from people here, but I mean, everybody here has been so patient. Um, if, one question to everybody, and then we want to open it up for questions. If Steve Wozniak were to run for office, do you think he would win? Show hands. That's pretty good. I can think that, even if you're four, I wouldn't think I'd win. <laughs> um, any questions here? Let's open it up. Who's got I questions? To raise hand. We've got, there's a gentleman right there. I think he was sitting next to Superman, so be careful. <laughs> right now. So a question I would like to have for you. At the very beginning of uh, this interview, you said that you didn't have broken to vote. So I was wondering, if you had the opportunity, would you sign up for your fiber? <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, my wife is from Kansas City, from the Kansas area, and I wish I were there to, just for Google Fiber. I wish I were a lot of places in the world just for Google Fiber, but I am where I am. Coast of California is a nice place to live. Um, I'm, I'm happy enough, and I missed out on one aspect of the experiences of today's internet. I do have a semi-broadband, just not real broadband, where I can order a movie from iTunes and watch it download. Sometimes I have to wait 13 hours to watch the movie the next day. That's unbelievable. I know. And even the cellular LTE was hit me broadband at first, up to seven megabits where I live. And now it's always usually down to one. So even my even LTE at my home. It's the wrong house. Anybody else? How about someone over here? How about this lady? Like my city is the same city Netflix is in. How about this? Do we have my microphone over here? Yeah, like this. Los Gatos, California, where Atari started the arcade industry and where the pet rock was invented. The pet rock, yeah. Los Gatos, California. Okay, okay. Okay, um, I have a question on the culture within a company. Do you think hierarchical culture will be good for an innovative company? Hierarchical? Um, I know. You know what? I'm not really very much a manager. When we started Apple, I said, I will not run a company. I will be an engineer. I will be the bottom of the org chart. I do not want to be involved in the politics of running a company. And so I hated it when the management got hierarchical and it slowed things down so much. I like the days when I like, I'm like an inventor who wants to run the laboratory and build the whole thing themselves. You know, design it, draft it, hook up the chips, solder the wires, test it, the software as well as the hardware. I just want to do the whole thing. And thereby, I skipped all the hierarchy and different division of responsibilities. And a manager would come in and, oh my gosh, the engineers would have to spend a long time writing a 40 page report of what they would do. And then, as they were developing it, if they got a great idea for something they hadn't thought of, oh, it would have to be a rewrite, re inclusion. And it was so difficult to move freely. So, um, um, no, I, I don't really like that. As a matter of fact, a lot of companies, some of their best stuff comes out of secret little projects. You might call them skunk works. Uh, Steve Jobs and Apple was famous for this, you know? Apple still is, you know, just little people, engineers working on their own, not being judged by everybody every instant of the day, and not having a, a firm schedule and a quotas and things like that to him. How about this gentleman right here in front? Can we get a microphone? Yeah, there we go. Although you do need some of that. You do need some of that to survive and guarantee to the owners that that's something. 
Um, besides Apple, what is the most uh, fascinating technology for you right now, which amazes you? Wow. Um, obviously, it's Siri existed before Apple bought Siri. Voice recognition, um, being able to answer questions like a human being, mobile products that seem to be like a human being. Um, Siri on the iPhone works the best so far, although Google Voice sometimes can understand things better because of what people are searching for is better key relevance. Um, robotics, um, I'm looking forward to robotics getting low enough cost that hobbyists and experimenters at home can build them like they just build computers. And I would, for example, we've got the little Roomba that runs around cleaning your, you know, vacuuming your, your floor. I would love a little robot that sits outside the driveway all night long, one square centimeter at a time. It washes my car <laughs> while I sleep. I'm waiting for that one at an affordable price. It's got to be an affordable price. You, know, you, you talk about robots and artificial intelligence. <laughs> Do you think we're ever going to see the time, let's say in our lifetime, in the next 30 years, 40 years, where machines actually develop a level of consciousness where we are no longer the most intelligent beings on the planet? I said no my whole life. And when Ray Kurzweil wrote his book Singularity, I disagreed with it. We don't know how the brain is wired. We cannot create a brain. The first program I wrote in my life was the Knight's Tour of Chess, where a knight piece hits every square on a chessboard exactly one time, and nothing came out, nothing came out. This computer could do a million things a second. It's trying all the possibilities. It didn't have a solution. I calculated the solution would come in 10 to the 25th years. That means that a fast computer, a billion times faster, a trillion times faster, isn't going to matter a bit. You need the intuition of the human mind to decide how to solve problems. Have we replaced any of the brain yet with computers? Well, you used to ask a smart person a question about the world. Now who do you ask? It starts with G-O and it's not God. So you ask Google and you get back tons more answers than a smart person would give. Somebody, if you get a, if you get a, a smartphone, you're sitting somewhere, sometimes even there's smart people around, you'll ask Google because you're going to get more complete answers. So we have replaced a part of the brain. Did we invent the internet to be a brain? Did we ever think out in the future the internet's going to replace a brain? No, it happened by accident. So I started thinking, I thought about Ray Kurzweil and how he predicts when computing technology that you can hold in your hand is going to be able to process as much information as fast as the brain does. And it's about 20 years from now, by his estimates. His methods of looking at exponential curves is a correct mathematical approach. You see nothing happening until it happens, and then you act like, oh, it was obvious. But a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people don't see if it is. Now, what I like to say is it's going to happen. Computers are going to get conscious, but it's going to be 20 to 100 years. And 100 years buys me. <laughs> I can never be judged. <laughs> but, uh, and I believe they're going to get conscious. We don't know how. We don't know the formula. They're going to act like they have feelings about us. It's going to become your best friend. Your hand. It's got enough senses already. You can speak it here. It'll be looking for you wherever you go. It'll tell you to look right because there's a pretty girl, and look left because there's a bookstore. So you think it's going to be benevolent? You think it's going to be a friend? But why? Why should it be a friend? Um. Well, because at first we're going to be the gods who created it. And second, we created it to do to take care of us. So we're going to be the family pet. But a, a well-taken care of dog that eats full leg and milk every night. That's my belief. You really believe that? Yeah, I think I don't think we're going to be ants that it steps on. You don't think it's going to be like the Terminator? Unfortunately. What I'm worried about, here's what I'm worried about. You know, I don't like to be that much in the future, because I'm an engineer and I know what we can build today. We don't know how to build this, but um, you know, what if it was smarter than a human being? Now, what if the best financial decisions for a company came from a computer and not from a human? And what if skipping the slow humans made a company even more profitable? We're already seeing lots of that. Any other questions? How about right over here? Give the microphone to you. Uh, you said that uh, one of your key things is around education and mentoring. What, what do you see in the role of technology going forward in the next few years around education and massive online courses and the like? I don't think that technology has changed education very much because our method of education 
classes of 30 students studying the same pages in the book every week, having the test on Friday. I don't think we haven't changed the way education works. We've just put in the computer as the modern book and the modern teacher. And maybe it's a little more interesting, but um, it hasn't really changed it. So I think, is there anything to change it? I don't want to say the same sort of things people have said for 200 years about finding those exceptional teachers that care, that can make class interesting, that can assign goals and projects. You know, you, you, people say that all the time, and education hasn't improved in 200 years. So it has to be something very new we haven't thought of yet. And the one thing that I do want is when computers get conscious and become your best friend, the student will be totally trusting his friend as a teacher. And now we can have one very low-cost teacher per student. One teacher per student can never fail. Let the students go in their own directions, at their own speeds, correct every problem they have on the way, but they've got to want it. They want some guidance like a human, but our machines, our computers today are not like humans. There's, there's, there's some kids who just learn everything on the internet. I would have been one of them. But we're not really at that point yet. You still want some feeling. I'm dealing with a friend, and I've got a reason to want to go in this direction. And if I get interested in computers study, or mathematics, or literature, I can just work on that one subject all day long and go as far, much farther than the school would let me go. I think that I'm hoping that happens in the future so that I can say that I had a little part in helping education improve. Oh, over here, this side right here. There's a hand. Yep, this lady right here. Hi, this is Sylvie Lepré. I'm from France. Uh, international school in Hanover is a uh, an Apple school. So the children are fun with uh, Apple, but the problem with the uh, education with Apple. They play a lot, so they become internet addict and gamers, and they don't work. So, do you have a solution for that? Uh, I hear that a lot, and I've heard that same comment for a lot for the last 40 years. You know, ever since the start of personal computers, oh my gosh, the kids get so intrigued by this new machine. It's like they're addicted to it. They aren't going to face normal humans when the internet came. They're doing all their stuff inside their own room and they're not talking to real humans. This is just the modern world. They're socializing more off the social networks and being anonymous, the shy person who could never talk to a human in real life, like the way I grew up, now have ways to be anonymous in chat rooms and socialize a lot more. Yeah, if they're just playing games and their whole life's going into games, um, that's probably not a healthy balance. Um, so there, there's some, some room for parental oversight, but um, I don't see a lot of games being that bad. I think that's just a part of it, something you go through when you're young. I look back when I was young, gosh, there was one summer I remember, and about all I did the whole summer was play solitaire, a whole ton of types of games of solitaire. And I don't feel that it helped me back. And also, it's one of those big, huge things as technology changes, we have these new abilities to work in different ways, and the young people grow up differently than the old people. Um, it's one of those big steamrollers you can't stop, so just get out of the way. There was a question right there with the microphone already. Yeah. Hi, I'm Laurent from the French Startup Jogging. I have a question. One month ago, you said that Apple should produce some iPhone working on Android. Do you really mean it? I did not say such a thing. Press misquotes me all the time. As I was answering a question about BlackBerry, and I pointed out that BlackBerry could have made a, a, an Android phone, and then I said, Apple could make an Android phone. As an aside, they could. It's an interesting technical discussion. I did not say Apple should. Every article tended to say Wozniak said Apple should. And no, they can. In other words, there's no technical limitation. Um, I, and I'm sure I also I also made comments that weren't reported that yeah Apple has people inside that would know the trade-offs you know look very well to handle that sort of thinking. So sorry sorry you um, you read what everybody read that's, that's not quite it. What about this, this notion of interoperability? You know, like if um, I want to update my, my iCalendar or my iTunes and, and I have to do it over the cloud, I, I have to do it with the iCloud. Yes, Apple tries to keep you in their own yeah. ecosystem. Why can't you change that? Um, 
I wish it were more open, as I look back to some of our big successes. The Apple II computer was all of our revenues for the first 10 years. Unbelievably open computer. All the hardware diagrams, the software, you could modify things, add things, change them. If you were technically inclined, um, you could develop your own products that plugged into it. Now, though, we have a lot of apps, so everything's gone to software. It's largely due to Steve Jobs was not a technical person. Well, um, I forget what I was going to get to. No, I'm trying to get you to tell me why you can't get Apple to open okay. up so that I have interoperability. Okay, another. The, when did Apple stock? Apple stock, we had some downs and ups, but it was about the same as our first product, the Apple II. The valuation of the company was about the same. Steve Jobs left. Steve Jobs came back. It was the same for years, and it didn't double until we finally had a great print product, the iPod. The iPod worked with iTunes, the best music program that had ever been done at that time. And luckily it was on a Macintosh. But did we say you have to have a Macintosh to own an iPod? As soon as we saw this great product, we wrote iTunes for Windows. We went open. We opened it up to the whole world, and we sold iPods to everybody in the world, and the stock value doubled forever. We were now a music company and a computer company. Do we write iTunes for Android phones? No. My, my feeling is we should, but I don't know all the facts, but I'm guessing that Apple should, this is not saying good, this is saying should, should write iTunes for Android and treat their music business as a separate business unit and sell the music to everybody in the world the iTunes way for their iPods um, because um, we really changed the world in that way. Why didn't we close it up and say, it's a force, we're trying to force you into an iPhone. I don't like that pushing and trying to force people to not have choices. I try to say, do the great products and attract them like a whole method. Yeah, do I, do I see Apple? Apple can't change hugely. Like with the Android phone, Apple's value is largely in a specialness of the brand, and um, how well they protect their customers and things like that. And boy, to go off in the Android world, have an Android division play the Android games of, of, you know, very much an openness to the world, it might spoil the whole image of Apple as the custom high-end, almost like jewelry company. So we're, at the end of the day, though, it's about control. Uh, I don't like the fact that it, it is partly about control. Yeah, I don't like that part. But it also delivers a better user experience than I do like that. Do you think the Apple user would actually suffer if there were... No, the, the Apple brand. The brand. The image of the brand. We the, we're, we're just passed the Coca-Cola to be number one brand in so, the world. But so, the, so this is about control of money. It's not about, it's not about the brand. Money. Yeah, the brand doesn't mean putting out, you know, lower class products that anybody can write software for and make it their own way. Apple is, the brand is partly around the control of the user experience. At the end of the day, what do you think is more important to end the company? Shareholders or the users? <laughs> I vote with the users, but nobody else in the company, nobody rightfully should. Yeah, it should always be, of course it has to be a company, has to make money or it goes out of business. And the right decisions are the ones that look at look at our, our government, how much how many trillions and tens of trillions of dollars in debt they are, and Apple's got two hundred billion in the bank account, you know. Yeah, I wish I wish countries would run like companies. Here's what we're gonna spend on this war. Oh, and here's what it's worth. Oh, it doesn't add up, ROI is wrong. Yeah. So if Obama called you and said, Can, can we get a loan, would you say yes? Jeez. Jeez. Okay. And one more question, we got time for one more question. All right, this lady back here, she's waving right here. See the lady there? Uh, way back. Uh, way back, way back. She's been really patient. Yeah, right there. It's hard for the ones in the back to get the yeah. attention. Yeah, I'm glad you saw that break. Yeah, she's, she's been patient. Fairness. Thank you very much. So, my question is, uh, when I just started to use uh, Macintosh, I was amazed by phonetical typing. Yeah, so, when you need to type something in Russian, phonetical is just perfect. Uh, but I miss very much swipe typing in Apple products at the moment. It is in Samsung, it is in other devices, but Apple, somehow, not yet. Are we going to have it? I can't say whether we're going to have it. I like swipe very much. 
Thank you, John. 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 Features like that, you'll find a bunch of features on a Samsung phone that aren't on an iPhone. You'll find a bunch of features on an HTC, maybe um, infrared remote control. And you won't find it on the iPhone. You'll find features on an iPhone that aren't on those. I don't think people choose their phones anymore because of features. I don't think it's all critical. You're, you're speaking about a different language. You're in a more of a special category, a niche category um, for the Russian. Um, I would probably not expect Swipe because Swipe has been around for a lot of years. A lot of people like it. Why doesn't Apple do it? I don't know. Do they have to pay a license fee? I don't know. It, it just seems so simple to allow that. Um, but Apple keeps their products. One good thing about the iPhone, for those masses of people that don't want to be technical, you don't have. That's one less option you have. One less thing you have to teach people that's not so obvious to the very simple person. So keeping the product simple is equivalent to keeping it easy to use. Um, I think we actually we have time for one more. You get to choose. Right. See you. One more, one more, yeah. Uh, well, way over there, there's somebody, wave your hand, and I'll tell you if you're the right one. Yeah, I see a hand waving. Right there, yeah, that's the end. That's the end. Thank, you, thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Sergio, I'm from Chile, and all the way here to CBIT. Very happy with it. Thank you for coming here. I would like to ask you, we, we've read uh, a lot of uh, autobiographies or biographies of different people, very famous people in Apple. Recently we had one from Tim Cook and his work. Uh, when are we gonna have yours? Uh, my autobiography? Well, you've got a memoir called I Was that I didn't, I didn't write it until my last child, my youngest child had finally graduated from high school and he left, um, he left to college and finally I was all alone. I started saying yes to things. I finally wrote that book. Um, it's an interesting one. It's a lot more to write. But you know what? I, I, I don't know. Um, it, it'll, it'll have to wait till I have time for it. I feel I don't have time right now. I'm really busy constantly traveling. There are movies being made. Those movies are kind of neat to watch too. Um, so let's hope it. I was thinking my next book will actually be a book on the pranks I've done. When is the movie on the pranks? Uh, There's yeah. no movie on the pranks, but the book, book on the pranks I would love to write, but you'd be shocked. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, before, before we get to the, the computer drawing, can I ask you to come over here? We want to show you this drawing here. Okay. Um, we've had this all week. This is new at the CBIT Global Conferences. We've got this artist who oh, basically wow. listens to what the speakers say and wow. she gets inspired. What do you oh think about gosh. this? This is this unbelievable. As soon as I looked at it, I said, oh my gosh, this is my favorite way to learn online. <laughs> it's very 20th yes. century though, isn't it? Yes. Um, wow, you drew that online. Jesus. Yeah. That's quite impressive. I'm impressed. Okay. Um, I Sold in the last couple of hours. 
All right, right. I wish we had a drum. My mom, my mom taught me always crunch up your little business cards. Right? Yeah, right. I wish we had a drum roll. No, isn't there an app for that? <laughs> Here. Thank you very much. It was great having you on.